so as I said, so two protocols, TCP and UDP. So they are both very useful. We already seen that, for instance, DNS is using UDP. We are further going to see other examples of protocols that use UDP. All right. So UDP is really useful. Um, and HTTP is something that is used by HTTP. We already seen that you need to open a connection and then start sending your requests. All right, so uh, what is the, the thing? So we're going we're gonna to go over, again, understanding the difference between the end host and routers. So it's really important to understand that actually the transport layer as the application layer is only available at the end hosts. Routers are not concerned with the layer four and layer seven. Uh, layer seven, because you may remember, as I said, we give numbers here and we skip the five and six. So that's the, the, the reason I keep referring to uh, layer uh, transport layer as a layer four. So there's no layer five and six. Uh, we're going to understand what are the requirements for the applications and see how the two protocols that we have, either UDP and TCP, match those requirements. Uh, we're going to go through the details of the protocols. All right. And what we'll see that basically there are a few concepts that are very useful to understand with this is how do we use the port numbers to multiplex multiple byte streams belonging to multiple applications, how to detect uh, corrupted data, all right, and then how to repair those uh, corrupted data. So that's for TCP because it's reliable. And we're going to introduce a flow control. You have a question for the next assignment. So we need to cover this at least by Wednesday. Okay, let's go. So as you may remember from the introduction, okay, let's go over this again. The design of the internet is end-to-end, -end, which means that the end host will host the applications. So that's very important. And this is the only location where actually you can run and install the application is on the end host on our computers. In the middle, the routers don't run applications. And in order to design the application, we use an API, a programming interface, which is actually the interface to the layer four. All right. So whenever you write an application, you interact with the services provided by the transport layer. Okay. The routers, which are in the, in the middle, they just forward the packet. So they receive a packet, they look at the IP address, and they forward the packet such as it can reach its destination. So routers, we will see that they use the IP protocol, which is at the layer three. Okay, so this is the IP protocol. So we're going to go over IP in the next coming weeks. The thing about the internet is that service provided by the routers is not reliable. So we may have many bad things happening, like packets can be lost, they can be corrupted. So bits may be swapped, the value may be swapped, they may be duplicated, they may be delayed, they may be received out of order. And those are obviously not acceptable for the applications. All right, We don't want to say to whoever wants to design the application that he needs to handle all those problems. Otherwise, it will make designing applications super hard. So in order to help the application, we put in the middle between the layer three and the application here, a layer which actually gonna make up for those shortcomings. So we say, okay, so in order to make things easier for layer seven, whoever is developing an application, we're gonna fix all the problems that the IP layer is not concerned with by adding uh, a new protocol here at the layer four. And that layer is end to end. It's only something that runs at the end host. So what do we have? If we have corrupted packet, mean that we need to detect if a packet is corrupted, we need to repair that error. So we repair by retranspitting. The same gonna happen with the losses if a packet is lost. So one of the reasons, and we'll see that later, we can lose a packet. Why? Because the router is overwhelmed. So the, 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 the queue at the router, they're not enough buffer. So we may drop a packet. So somebody, somebody have to repair this. So the end host can do that. Uh, discarding the duplicated packet. So we add sequence numbers and reordering the packets. We add in the layer four header, a sequence number. Okay, and if we do that is, as we said, the application have requirements. We don't want to put the burden on the designer of the application. So we offer extra service that will be used through the API that we just talked about. Anyway, so quick one, because we talk about packet loss, and I know that it's maybe 
We're going to see that when we're going to look inside the network, but let's have a quick look at what is happening here. In the middle between the end host, so here I have a client, I have a server. So you know that in the middle you have routers. So the routers are very busy processing the packets. And the, the only thing that I need to do is since I have multiple interfaces, I need to decide where to send the packet next. All right, so I need to decide. So it's like a crossroad where I have multiple exits. So I need to follow the right exit such as the packet can reach its destination. So of course, in proce processing packets take time and you may be receiving packets faster than you can process them. So you need to have a buffer where the packets wait until they are processed. So since the buffer may be full, so if you don't have any, enough space in those buffers, you're gonna drop the packets whenever they are in the excess. So dropping the packet will create a loss. So that the fact that it's full, this is what we call the congestion in a network, all right? Okay, so you drop the packet, you lose them, so it means that the destination is missing a packet, so somebody needs to repair it. So mainly the losses will be due to congestion, we can also have corrupted packets. The corrupted packets are due, for instance, to the fact that when you use Wi-Fi with wireless, it's not really reliable. So sometimes bits will be swapped. So the value will swap. So you have a corrupted packet, so you need to correct these errors. <clears throat> so finally, what do we have? So here we have the layer three. So once we said we have IP addresses, based on these routers, going to forward the packets until they reach the destination. We have the application layer, layer seven, and we already said that those are your browsers, your client mails, any kind of application you're using as a user. And in the middle, because here we said bad things can happen, losses, errors, and so on, somebody needs to correct those. So we add this layer, which is a layer four, which actually comes with two protocols and TCP is a reliable, all right? So in the network layer, we use IP addresses. At the uh, transport layer, since we may have multiple applications, we have the port numbers. We already talked a little about them. We're going to see them in, in more details in the sector. OK, so to understand what are the services provided by TCP or UDP, so we have two protocols at the layer four. Let's try to understand what are the requirements for an application. And we may classify them according to at least three criteria. And those are the ones that actually have been considered back in the 70s or even the 80s when uh, pr transport protocols were introduced. So first of all, uh, do we need the application to be reliable? Well, we will see that some application needs 100% reliability. So we cannot lose data. Some others, they don't really care. They're not so sensitive, okay? So we may be tolerant to some losses. The same goes with throughput. So do we need a minimal throughput in order to make sure that the application can give that service? So obviously in Zoom, when you need to receive the video to see me well, you need to be able to receive uh, chunks of data quite fast. Otherwise, if there's a delay, uh, you, you cannot have a, a real-time conversation as we have with a video on. The time sensitivity, so this is pretty much the same, but here it's not so much the amount of data you want to receive, but it's how often should you receive my voice in order to understand what I'm saying. You know, So every 100 milliseconds, you need to receive a packet such as you can understand my voice. Otherwise, if there's large gaps or it goes too fast, you won't be able to understand the voice. And obviously we have security, but once again, just remember the internet was not designed with any requirement regarding the security. It was add layer, but as it is, the architecture that we will see, security was not a concern, right? Even though this is a strong requirement nowadays, but back in the 80s, security was like out of scope, all right? So let's take a table here. So on the left here, what do I have? I have multiple examples of applications, file transfer, emails, web documents, then we have audio video, so either it's real time, like Zoom, or it's store, like when it's Netflix, and interactive gaming. And let's go over the different criteria that we listed in the, in the previous slide, so the losses. So when I transfer a file, for instance, if it's an update for Windows or something less, like this, if it's a binary file, of course, there's no way I can basically 
uh, be, uh, I'm very sensitive to any loss. So I shouldn't lose any of the data. The same goes for the email. The same goes for the pictures in the web page. Okay, those cannot work if we lose data. Okay, a few, uh, few bytes. We need to have 100% reliability here. When it comes to audio and video, we can see that actually when you receive the stream, even if you lose few bytes, you not you may not be so sensitive to a pixel which actually doesn't have the right color or to my voice. The fact that if few bytes are missing, you still can understand what I'm saying. All right. So it means that here we may be tolerant. We're not so sensitive to losses. The same goes with interactive gaming. Uh, we are somehow tolerant, okay? But once again, we can see that here we have something that it needs to be 100% reliable here, but here we, we are tolerant. If we look at the other, uh, which is the throughput, so the throughput, so if it comes to file transfer and so on, so let, 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 me, let me clear about this, all right? So even though we may be more happy if I can download the same file faster, it doesn't make a difference to the type of service. So it means that whether it takes an hour or a day to download something, at the end, you're going to get the file. So actually, yes, it may improve the quality of experience, but it doesn't going to make a difference to the type of the service. But if you take now the real time, either video stored streaming with Netflix or things like this, if you don't have enough bandwidth, you won't be able to feed the player fast enough such as you can watch a movie without, without stopping, okay? And if you watch a movie, you cannot say to the, to the user, oh, wait five minutes because we need to buffer more data such as I can feed the player and play the next sequence. So that's the reason here we cannot tolerate the fact that we don't have enough throughput. The same goes with the delay. So the delay means actually how, how long does it take to receive one packet to the next one? And so when we are doing file transfers, web downloads, or emails, well, the fact that we don't receive the data at the right timing doesn't make a difference. But when it comes to voice or video, it's really important, such as for my voice, for instance, to be able to understand what I'm saying, your computer should receive like the packets every 100 milliseconds. If there's a gap here, and for some reason you, you receive the next packet 200 milliseconds later, yeah, this will affect my voice, all right? So as we may see here, we have two main, um, two main uh, uh, type of applications. We have the application which on one side, they don't, they're not really, they are very sensitive to the losses, but on the other side, they don't need too much throughput or delay guarantees. On the other side, we have, the application that have very strong requirements regarding the throughput and the delay, but they can tolerate the loads. So that's the reason we introduced two types of protocols. One is TCP, which is super reliable, but cannot provide any guarantees regarding the time. And on the other side, we have UDP, which actually is, is tolerant to the losses, but you need to make sure that actually the data is received on time. All right. So let's see the, the different type of things that we can do. So we already said that when we use IP, so this is my layer three here, we already said that packets may be lost, all right? And so when you have a web server, for instance, and the packet two, number two is missing here, it may be a problem, right? The page is corrupted or the pictures that I'm downloading is, is, is corrupted, all right? So in order to uh, fix this problem, we introduce TCP here which is actually a protocol that runs at the source and the destination. And what's going to happen? Because of this protocol, we're going to be able once to retransmit the packet that have been lost. So you see that the packet number two will be retransmitted. So still, we need to understand how do we detect the losses. And what is more, we can reorder the packet because you see that if the number two is retransmitted later, you're going to receive two as a last segment. So we need the sequence number to put them back in order, all right? So that's what TCP is going to do. On the other side, if I'm using UDP, UDP doesn't bring anything here. So it means that a loss won't be repaired and you won't be able to reorder anything. So as you may see, so UDP doesn't bring much guarantees compared to IP, okay? So once again, so in the transport layer, which is a layer four, 
okay? Just remember that number. We have two protocols, UDP, and we call it best effort. So which means that if we have resources enough, no problem. But if we start losing packets, we won't be able to recover them. And on the other side, we have uh, TCP, which is a reliable byte stream. So this is really important, and I'll try to explain you the difference between a datagram and a byte stream. So those are two ways of designing the service. So I will show you through a, a separate slide the reason we have this. So they share two main services are shared by UDP and TCP. So they do exactly the same here. So first of all, we have multiplexing and demultiplexing. What does it mean here? It means that we may have multiple applications at the same time sending their own bytes. And thanks to the port number, we'll be able to ID to which application those bytes are intended for. All right, so that's the reason you can run multiple applications together. And the other thing is error detection. So we will see that by adding a header here, I have a field which is a checksum. And the checksum will help the destination to detect if some, some bits have been corrupted. So I think that we already talked about how to do the checksum, but I will show you is a pretty simple uh, way of doing this. And specific to TCP, what do we have? We have the retransmission, which means that either it's corrupted or missing. We can uh, retransmit and repair those losses. We can reorder or avoid duplicate bytes by adding numbers, sequence numbers. They have flow control and congestion control, but this is out of scope of a bachelor class. Uh, you will probably have this if you do a master in masters, you will uh, understand more about congestion control. So those are specific to TCP. So once again, what do we have? We have UDP. So we said that this is a datagram mode. And to understand the difference, it means that we need to understand the interaction between the layer seven, the application, and the layer four. So what is happening is the fact that here you have a buffer where the application will go and write the bytes to be sent, okay? So you have a buffer and you add the bytes. So you need to understand that the application may fit the buffer at different times. So at some point, I'm gonna write like 100 bytes, later 20 bytes, and so on. What you need to understand is UDP, whenever there are bytes, you're gonna extract the bytes, add a header, and send it right away. So whatever is the size of what the application have written, it doesn't make a difference for UDP. You take the bytes, you put a header, you send it. That's how UDP is working. And if you remember, we already said that this will end up at the layer two inside the frame. You remember the frame with the header and the trailer? Right? So we said that here we have a maximal size. So it means that UDP doesn't really care about how many bytes it should send, either to fill the frame or to avoid fragmenting this uh, datagram in multiple pieces. TCP, on the contrary, will know about the size of a frame. And it will try to make sure that when you have bytes in the buffer at the layer four, you're gonna extract as many bytes as you need, such as you can feel exactly the size of the frame. And so that's the reason in TCP, we don't really care about how many bytes have been written by the application layer. You wait for until having enough bytes, such as you can send a full frame. Any question? No, Mustafa. Okay, no problem. And I cannot mute, okay, he's muted now. Okay, so let's take, let, let's take, let's take your uh, UDP. So UDP, as we said, so here the application is writing some bytes. So whatever the bytes have been written in one action, this will end up creating a UDP datagram, you can see here. And depending on if it's too big giving a frame, IP will need to fragment and to create two fragments. So what it means, it means that IP need to reassemble those two pieces, such as whatever have been written, written here can be read by the application 
as it was written. So one action at the application, you can read exactly what happened. In TCP, this is not, to, not the case. In TCP, what we do, you write, but TCP doesn't really uh, worry about how much bytes have been, how many bytes have been written. So what's going to happen? TCP sometimes will wait until you have enough bytes, such as these bytes can fill exactly one frame. So the size of TCP depends on the maximum size of a frame. Okay. So let's do a quick math. If this size, this side here, this size is twenty hundred. Uh, not twenty. Sorry, fifteen hundred. And if here uh, TCP at twenty and IP to add twenty, so it means that if I refer here to the MSS which was here. How many bytes should I read such as I can match exactly this maximal size for the frame? Can you chat or give me the answer? So if I'm going to add 20 bytes of header at TCP and IP, and I need to fill the frame, I shouldn't exceed how many bytes in total when I take in the buffer here. Very simple math. Yes, exactly. Oh, wow, so many answers. So I cannot name everybody, but Jenny, Zetong, Gavin, Lei, Adrian, uh, Haojian, yeah, you are right. So I need to read exactly this. And if I read only that specific number, it's because I want one to send a frame that is full, and I want to avoid fragmentation. Very simple. UDP doesn't do that. Even if you send one byte, UDP will send one frame with one byte. In TCP, no. So it means that in TCP, I will need to wait until the application has passed enough bytes. And if it's not enough, you can be sitting there, not forever, because you have a timer. And TCP have a timer, will say that, OK, I've waited long enough, so let me send a small frame. Okay, But to be efficient, TCP needs to send exactly the number required by the maximal size of the data that can fit inside a frame at the layer two. Um, so this is a byte stream. The reason why is a byte stream, because now you may see that even if the application is writing a piece, a chunk of bytes here, since in the buffer here, you don't even know how many bytes have been written, because you can see that the application can write 10 times, but TCP can send five segments. So it means that in the process, I will lose the synchronization between the applications because I have no way of tracking how many times the application wrote the bytes in the buffers. So that's the reason it's only a byte stream. No way, no limitation. Okay. So another difference is the fact that in TCP, we have a connection, and we already talked about it. You may remember from the, the scene, CNAC, and so on. And you may remember that the connection is due to the fact that in the memories of both the two, uh, the sender and the receiver, you need to put TCBs. Blocks where actually you're going to maintain some states or variables regarding um, the communication between the sender and the receiver. So it means that even before you can start sending the data bytes, you need to make sure that those states have been installed. So that's the connection. So when you say that we need to set up a connection, you need first to reserve some memories, enough memory, to fit the variables that you will need later. And those variables include a lot of stuff, like timers, sequence numbers, something you need to remember regarding the segments that you are sending or receiving. In UDP, we don't have a connection. It's connectionless. So it means that no need to worry about having any memory. So you don't remember about anything. You just send as it is, and you have no memory of what you did. So it means that there are no states. And because there's no states, is unreliable, okay? This is not reliable at all. So first, first two services that are shared by UDP and TCP, we said is uh, multiplexing. 
So what about multiplexing? We use port numbers. So it means that if on your computer you are running multiple services, such as here, you see that here I have the web server. So this is HTTP. And another server, which is FTP. So FTP is a file transfer protocol. So it's, it's, it's some other kind of service, but both are using TCP. At some point, you may send data. And because of the port number, you can exactly know to which application they intend to. And you can send at the same time for both the application bytes coming from the same client. So it means that to make sure that actually you can ID exactly where the bytes intended for, you need the IP plus the port number. So it means that the TCP connection have on one side the IP and the port number, and here the IP and the port number. So it means that you have four information for connection, for IP, IPs plus port numbers. And that's very important. In UDP, we have the same, the same kind of, uh, of, uh, of port number. So let's say on this side, I have a server. I have a DNS server plus DHCP. So they can both be running on the same server, on the same host. But hopefully, whenever you receive both requests, thanks to the port number, you know exactly where it goes. So hopefully, we have the port numbers. Something that is really weird is you remember that the IP is at the layer three, but we also need the IP at the layer four because the port number is not enough since it's a local, uh, the, the, the scope of the value is local. So it means that the port number may be used by multiple computers. So the only way to ID a TCP connection in a new unique way is to use also the port numbers, uh, the IP number. So the IP address is not only seen at the layer three, but also used by TCP to have a unique ID for a connection. Okay, so the port numbers, so they are 16 bit long. Okay, so it means that it start is two power 16. So that's the reason the maximum value is 65,535, whatever. So those are application, so they are ID for the application running on, on a host, okay? And this is what will allow you as a host to be receiving and sending at the same time bytes for multiple applications, right? Without the port number, you will be stuck with a single application. So here you can have multiple applications running at the same time. On the server side, so be careful because here there's, there's a little thing that I need to add. So we have well-known port number. So those one have been reserved and those values run from zero to 1033. Those you cannot use for any other services that have been reserved here for that usage. And you remember that HTTP, for instance, use 80 on the server side. On the client side, okay, you may use a port number that is not reserved, but be careful those are true for any of the services that are not system services. So what I mean by that is you remember that when you use DNS or even though no, maybe DNS is not a good example. So DHCP, we haven't talked about it, but if you have a client and a server, all right, the port numbers will be some standardized. So you also have port numbers have been standardized for system protocols, okay? So when I say that the port numbers are reserved, they're not reserved only for the server side, they may be also reserved for the client, depending if those are system services. The example will be DHCP, but I will show that you that later, okay? So it means that on the client, you may also use port numbers that have been reserved for the service that I'm running, okay? Port numbers are really important because they are also used by uh, firewalls in order to block some applications. So uh, in order to prevent, for instance, I don't know, uh, employees, from doing web, they can block the traffic based on the port number. So if you have an incoming segment coming from port 80 with the IP that is blacklisted, because this is, a, a, this is a Facebook IP, and you don't want your employees from checking their Facebook account, you're gonna block any incoming port 80 segment coming from the IP of Facebook, for instance. So you see, so the port numbers can help with this. 
So the other thing that we have, so we talked about the port number and multiplexing. The second service we talked about is uh, error detection. And to make sure that your segment or your datagram is not corrupted, we use a checksum. So here I give you uh, the header of UDP. So the header of UDP is very simple. So if here I have two bytes, two bytes, and I have two lines, what is the size, please, of a, of a UDP header? Eight, exactly. So you see that very small. I mean, for a protocol, this is maybe one of the smallest header you will ever see with a protocol. Eight is very small. Given that we will see that TCP is 20, at least 20. So you see that UDP is very small. And part of it, what we have, we have the port numbers. That makes sense because those are the IDs. The length, the total length of your datagram. So this is all of this, plus the checksum. Okay. And the checksum is actually something that we're going to use in order to make sure that none of the data, once they are received by the receiver, have been corrupted in route. So when they are en route, sometimes the bits can be corrupted. So what you do, you check at the destination if actually they've been corrupted. So in order to do this, so I don't know if I have an example here, but anyway, that's really simple. The most important thing that you need to know is that actually the checksum is not calculated just based on the datagram itself, unfortunately. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be calculated based also on what we call the pseudo header. And if you check about the information that are available in the pseudo header, they're coming from the IP layer. Uh-oh. So it means that once again, if you are the layer four and you use UDP, in order for UDP to calculate the checksum, it will need the information from the IP layer that you're going to feed UDP with in order to do the calculation. So you see you have the IP addresses, the protocol field that comes from IP. I don't want to get into the details of what those fields are doing, but what you need to understand is that header is not sent. You just use it to do the checksum calculation, the value you, you put it in the checksum, then you send UDP, and once the receiver gets the UDP, ask for IP for the information to construct the pseudo header and to check again the checksum. All right, so this is a pseudo header. So since we, I talk about UDP, so let's go over the details of UDP. So UDP, once again, is a datagram service. So it means that once the application gives you some bytes, even one byte or one gigabyte, you take all of this, you add the eight bytes of the header, and you send it. UDP is pretty simple, right? Pretty easy going. So you use the port numbers. That's the reason they are available in the header. Plus the checksum in order to uh, be able to corrupt uh, to uh, detect the bytes that are corrupted. Anyway, so we have the checksum, so I will show you how to do the details. So what you need to understand in UDP, so UDP, the checksum is optional, so it depends on the application. So the application may ask UDP to uh, verify the checksum, but once again, UDP won't do anything about it. So the only thing that UDP is gonna do is notify the application that, oh, be careful, I know that some bytes are corrupted. It's up to you. Do you want to drop this, the, the bytes because they are corrupted or you want to go along with them? So this is the only thing that UDP is going to do, all right? UDP is not reliable. Okay. Um, so the other thing is, the only thing that is done here, once again, it will allow bytes to be exchanged between two end hosts without having the overhead of making reliable and you and and making sure that you uh, you need to delay the data because they need to be repaired or put back in order so udp is faster meaning that you have to be careful with this kind of statement it only means that whenever you need to receive something you won't delay it because you need to retransmit it okay so it doesn't mean that it's faster, but because you have to do less checkup, you need to check less things, it goes faster, natural, right? Uh, the other reason we use UDP, okay? You may remember that UDP is used for DNS. 
Why? Because a server receives so many requests that using TCP with the TCBs and the connection is impossible, is not scalable. So since using connections is impossible, okay, let me use UDP. So it doesn't mean that UDP is better. No, but we have no choice. And the other, the other protocol is DHCP. Why? Because DHCP, you remember that if I use TCP, I need a connection. The connection needs IP addresses to identify the connection. If you don't have an IP address, and that's why you're using DHCP, without any IP, you cannot have a connection. So you cannot have TCP. So you cannot have DHCP. So since you don't have an IP, I'm going to use uh, UDP for DHCP. We, we, we're going to see that later. So anyway, let's take an example here. So once again, this is the UDP header here. So we have the port numbers. We have the length. So I hope it's 12. Yes, because the header is 8 plus how many, how many bytes? 4. So we have 12. Okay, so that explains the, uh, the 12 here. So it's the total size of UDP. 8 for the header, and those are the data. So to calculate the checksum, as I said, but I think the example is too simple here. <laughs> Normally, so I keep the sort of header on the side. But what you need to remember is on top of this, I have the pseudo header. All right. So on top of this, I, I should I should I should modify this. So here I have the pseudo header. So I didn't want to make it too complicated, but you also have the bytes that are provided by IP. But the uh, the, the calculation doesn't make a difference. I take each of the bytes, 16 bits, and I'm gonna add them up. I add them, and the value that I have, I will take the complement to one, and that's the value I put in the checksum. So why do I take the complement to one here? You see that I reverse the zeros and the ones, because now when the receiver is gonna do the calculation, if you do this, if you do this with a checksum, what is the expected value that you should be, you should get if you do the summation including the checksum? It should be all ones. And so it's much easier. So if you don't if you don't have the summation that is only once and you have a zero, it means that there's a corrupted uh, byte somewhere. All right. So that's the reason we take the red value instead of the black one. All right. Uh, the other thing you should be uh, you should be very careful is also let's say if I have a one here. And the one here, it means that I have a carry, right? So you need to re-inject this one in the sum. So actually, you're going to have a one here, right? If there's a carry, you need to add it to the already six, or existing 16 bits, okay? There's a carry, so you need to add this up here. So you don't drop it. You don't say, oh, my God, there are too many bits. Let's drop it. No, no, you, you need to add it again, okay? So to come back to the question regarding why do we need the checksum? Basically, you need to see that when I do this calculation here, right? And again, I need to go over the thing. Do you think that it's super, how to say, super robust? Is there cases where I may miss some errors? Can it be cases where actually the checksum is not strong enough to detect any or all the cases? You see, if, for instance, this one, I have a swap here to zero, and this one goes to one, can I detect this kind of errors? No. So what it means, it means that since IP is using the same checksum, and you have TCP and UDP on top of this, so what is happening is the fact that since some errors may not be detected by IP, TCP and UDP won't trust IP because some losses may not seen, some corrupted bits. So in that case, you're going to double check what IP is already supposed to check just to make sure that actually IP didn't, didn't actually slip through one, of the, one error that it couldn't see. And so since TCP is on top of IP, you know, you cannot really lie to the application and say, oh, I'm sorry, it's not my fault, you know, it's IP fault. No, no, you are on top of IP, so you need to cover all the cases, even if IP uh, missed some of the errors. So you double check just because you cannot trust the IP checksum. 
And your question is a good one because since, so this is for V4, in IPv6 now we don't have enough, anymore any checksum at the IP layer because we know that the transfer layer is already doing the checksum. So we removed this from, uh, from uh, IP. So that is for UDP. I think that we went through the two only functions. So as I said, the multiplexing based on the pot numbers plus the checksum to be able to detect corrupted uh, bits. That's it. UDP doesn't do anything more. All right. So this is a pseudo header, as I already explained. So no problem about that. Um, I will ask you a question later regarding this, but I think it's fine. Any questions regarding UDP? No, it's okay. All right. Uh, yeah, let, let, I already talked a little about about uh, this. Uh, so, but I write this down in the in the slide as well. So two functions, and those are shared with TCP. So TCP does the same. So this is in common. Uh, once again, you try to avoid the complexity and the overhead of having a reliable delivery. So that's the reason we may use it. Uh, and uh, is designed for uh, application that needs to go fast without having to wait for the overhead or the latency due to having a reliable delivery. So what it means, it means that it's better to get the data right now uh, instead of late. So it means that even if you lose something on the way, it's better to lose it than waiting later to receive the, corrupt, the, the correction. So the advantage is uh, no setup. So no need to wait for a connection. You can send the data right away. No connection states. So it means that it's super light. So you don't need to uh, uh, block some memories. So you don't have any overhead on the servers. And the header is so super small as well. So you don't use so much bandwidth when you have UDP. All right. So those are the advantage. So application that use UDP, as I said, DNS, DHCP. Okay. So those are the two classic ones. Uh, most of the time is also the video conferencing. So you remember that when we do uh, when we do a Zoom in Wireshark, you can see so much UDP because you Zoom is using UDP. Makes sense since you don't need to make it reliable, but you need to be fast and timely delivery. So UDP is the only one that can do that. Uh, anyway, so I will talk about the NAT one in, in IP. Uh, 